today REITs offering historically high dividend yields and this is because their share prices have crashed over the past two years even as most REITs kept hiking their dividend payments. Higher dividends coupled with lower share prices have resulted in much higher dividend yields and in some cases these yields have now reached up to 10%. Hey everyone, this is Yoshi of Rana Small Investment Firm that specializes in REIT investing. In today's video, I want to talk to you about two 10% yielding REITs that we are currently accumulating for our own portfolio. But before I get into it, I want to let you know that we're currently running a New Year's sale for REIT newsletter High Yield Landlord. So if you want to access our full portfolio, now is a great time to join us for a two week free trial. This is a real free trial because you won't be charged anything in the first 14 days. So if you want to join us just for that period and cancel, that's perfectly fine with us. So the first 10% yielding read that I want to discuss here is called New Lake Capital Partners. Its ticker symbol is NLCP. This is my favorite REIT among those that specialize in cannabis cultivation facilities. It has risen quite a bit in recent weeks, just like most other REITs, but it has still massively underperformed its close peer, innovative industrial properties. And I don't think that this is because of fundamental reasons. Rather, I think that this is simply because it has a smaller listing. And as a result, the flows of capital are a lot slower. But from a fundamental perspective, we think that New Lake is quite a bit more attractive than innovative industrial properties. And here are six reasons why. The first reason is that New Lake is one of just a few REITs that has zero debt. It's actually sitting on a very large net cash position that represents about 10% of its market cap. And this puts it in a very strong position to play offense as well as defense. Then the second reason why we favor New Lake is that it's exclusively focusing on limited license jurisdictions. And we think that this is especially important for cannabis cultivation facilities since your tenants are quite a bit riskier and it's inevitable that you eventually run into some lease delinquencies as well as some vacancies. By focusing on limited license jurisdictions, we think that New Lake is significantly mitigating these risks because the supply of these properties is limited by the licenses, but the demand for cannabis is always growing and therefore the value of this property should be sustainable. Then the third reason why we like New Lake is that it's about eight times smaller than innovative industrial properties and we think that this should allow it to grow a lot faster over the long run. This small size means that every new acquisition will really move the needle for New Lake and it will also allow it to be very selective with its future investments. Moreover, as we noted already earlier, New Lake today has no debt on its balance sheet and so this also means that in the future it could accelerate its growth by adding some debt on its capital structure. Then the fourth reason is that New Lake is today priced at a lower valuation and that's despite having better properties, no debt and stronger long-term growth prospects. Currently, it's priced at eight times FFO, a 10% dividend yield, and an estimated 20% discount to its net asset value. In comparison, innovative industrial properties today priced at roughly 12 times FFO, a 7.5% dividend yield, and a 20% premium to its net asset value. I think that this higher valuation has nothing to do with fundamentals. On the contrary, in an efficient market, you would expect New Late to trade at a premium given that it has no debt and better assets and stronger growth prospects. But in this case, New Lake is priced at a discount because it's not listed on a major exchange, whereas Innovative Industrial Properties has a listing on the Nasdaq. The fifth reason is that New Lake is today focusing on share buybacks, which are creating a lot of value for shareholders. They already completed one share buyback authorization and they immediately authorized another one with the management indicating that they plan to keep on buying more shares as long as they remain discounted. Today, the implied cap rate of their shares is about 15% and therefore these buybacks are highly accretive on a per share basis. And then finally, the sixth reason why we favor New Lake is that we think it has a better catalyst for future upside than innovative industrial properties. As I already noted earlier, Innovative Industrial Properties has a better listing than New Lake and this is causing it to trade at a premium valuation today. Innovative Industrial Properties is traded on the New York Stock Exchange whereas New Lake is just traded over the counter and this limits the potential pool of buyers for its shares. However, as New Lake grows in size and the rules change in the coming years, we expect New Lake to seek a better listing and this could be a strong catalyst that would reprice the stock at a higher valuation. If New Lake just repriced at the same multiple as Innovative Industrial Properties, it would need to rise by 50% from here and while you wait, you earn a 10% dividend yield. And best of all, I think that the downside risk is quite limited in the case of New Lake when compared to some other high yielding rates. 
Typically, the worst case scenario for REIT is that it has to file for bankruptcy because it's not able to handle its debt. And as a result, the equity gets completely wiped out. This is a real risk for some of the highest yielding REITs like Medical Properties Trust. However, because New Lake has zero debt, it's not facing the same downside potential. Even if New Lake had to cut its rents by 30% across the board, it would still trade at a relatively high implied cap rate, a reasonable FFO multiple, and it would still be able to pay a pretty decent dividend yield. I of course don't see that happening, but it's just to show you that the downside is much better protected in the case of New Lake than some of the other high yielding rates. In fact, despite suffering some tenant difficulties in 2023, the company was still able to grow its FFO on a per share basis thanks to the lease escalations that it has, as well as all the share buybacks. Just recently, they announced another 3% hike to their dividend, which is very impressive coming from such a high yielder. So all in all, we think that the risk to reward of New Lake is very compelling at these levels. It's priced at such a high yield simply because cannabis is today out of favor, but market sentiment can change really quickly and perhaps a few years in the future it will be loved again and the market will reprice New Lake at a much higher valuation. Now, before I go into the second company, could you please do me a huge favor and click the like button that really helped me a lot to grow this channel. Thank you so much for all your support. The second 10% yielding read I want to discuss is called Unity Group, ticker symbol UNIT. This is an infrastructure read that owns a portfolio of fiber networks and is today offered a 10% dividend yield because share price has crashed over the past years. I think that this crash has happened because of two main reasons. Firstly, the REIT has a bit more leverage than your typical REIT. It's debt to EBITDA is about six times and this has caused the market to worry following the recent surge in interest rates. And then the second reason is that Unity is heavily concentrated on one tenant called Windstream and this tenant is alleging that its rent is going to come down significantly once its lease expires. And those are significant risks and there is no sugarcoating it. But the story is more complex and the market appears to have missed some very important elements here. Firstly, concerning the balance sheet, it's important to know that Unity has no major debt maturities for years to come. It's today focusing on deleveraging the balance sheet and by the time its debt comes due, interest rates will likely be quite a bit lower. The Fed has indicated up to three rate cuts in 2024 and more in 2025. So already in a few years from now, Unity should be in a much better position to handle its debt than it is today. And then concerning the lease with Windstream, it's important to consider that it won't expire before 2030. This leaves Unity plenty of time to keep diversifying its business, grow new revenue sources, deleverage its balance sheet, to be in a stronger position to negotiate with Windstream when its lease comes due. Moreover, at the recent REIT conference, the CEO of Unity seemed quite confident that the current market rate is fair and should stay more or less the same once the lease expires. This is simply because their portfolio of fiber networks is essential to the communities they serve, they've only grown in demand, and their replacement cost has grown very significantly following the recent inflation. Therefore, it seems that Windstream's allegations could be simply a negotiation strategy, and while the rent may still come down, the market is perhaps overreacting a bit here. And this is very evident in the company's valuation. Right now, they have about six and a half billion of revenue under contract. They're also expecting to generate one billion of free cash flow on top of its dividend by 2030. And despite that, their market cap is just 1.4 billion. It's so cheap because the market is not giving much value to the Windstream lease. Today, it's pricing it at a 19% implied yield. But if you use the more reasonable yield, the share price of the company would need to double, triple or even quadruple. So how I see it is that the risks are more than priced in and the risk reward has become very compelling given the very low valuation, no debt maturities for years to come and the long lease term that it still has with Windstream. I would add here that the CEO of the company just recently bought 1 million worth of stock in the open market and he knows best what's the fair value of these properties as well as their future rent levels. He appears to think that the market has gotten it wrong and that the shares have significant upside potential and while you wait, you earn a 10% dividend yield. And then the final point I want to make here is that while the 10% dividend yield is very well covered by FFO, it really wouldn't surprise me if they decided to cut it in order to accelerate the deleveraging. The market is today mainly concerned about the company's long-term ability to service debt and therefore cutting the dividend to accelerate debt pay down could be a positive catalyst for the stock. 
So these were two 10% yielding REIT investment opportunities, but there are many more such high yielding opportunities in the REIT market today. And if you want to access my full portfolio, you can join High Yield Landlord, which is my REIT newsletter for a two week free trial. You won't be charged anything in the first 14 days and it will give you full access to my entire real money portfolio. And finally, once more, could you please click the like button? That really helped me a lot to grow this channel and produce this content for you. Thank you so much in advance. See you at my next one. Bye-bye.